Use your adoption. So. to be on the trailer in HD. Yes, I, I decided to upgrade my computer over the weekend and had to learn how to use all the, I mean, I hadn't upgraded my computer in quite some time. So I had to relearn how to use a significant number of, uh, of uh, is there still, is there an echo? Ah, oh, why is there an echo? I have the microphone. I'm supposed to be using the mic. Ah. Let me, how about now? Is it a little better now? Is the audio... Oh, how about now? How about now? Is that better? I should have just fixed it. Oh, good. Okay, I had two audio uh, captures. My fault. See? Technical difficulties. So, so uh, yes. So, um... Uh, new computer, uh, and I had to learn on uh, a Sunday how to use Photoshop. Uh, the new, I had all the numbers I had to put in for movie math, and Photoshop has a very complicated uh, uh, system for how to put numbers in. I mean, it, it's it's nuts, but I got it done, and I was very, very, you know, you guys made me feel nice with all the nice comments, and I, I, I was very happy to see such a nice reaction because uh, it's scary to try it's scary to try new things, man. Uh, but yeah, now the picture is super sharp. Uh, and I have to sit a little further away or else it looks weird, I discovered. Hey, Nintendard. All right, hold on. Let me gift my uh, five memberships of the week. All right, hold on. Here we go. Let's see here. Gifting five memberships. Here it comes. Huzzah! All right. So, uh, yes, the Oscars were last night. Uh, what did everybody think of the show? What were your thoughts on the show? Did you have a, a good time watching it? Uh, I thought at the end of the day it ended up being pretty good. It felt to me very much like a great office party rather than like, you know, celebrating film for all time. Uh, but, you know, it was still, I still think it worked out. All right, Paul, Paulie didn't even watch it. Okay, it seems that most of you kind of enjoyed it. Uh, I do a poll. I know you guys like the polls, but I want to get right into the, to the commentary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through my in-depth thoughts for the evening, uh, you know, by my tweets. And, you know, you saw my brief thoughts last night, but this way you'll be able to kind of see, uh, you know, well, how I really felt about it and my, my emotions as the night unfolded. Uh, and then, of course, as always, you can ask me anything that you would like at the end of the stream. Uh, and I appreciate every, you know, the chat, chat's going very fast. Didn't I put it on, I thought I put it on um, delay. Did I? Maybe I forgot today. Hmm. Uh, is it going too fast for everybody? I think it's going pretty good. I feel pretty good about it. All right. Uh, it is on slow mode, right? That's what I thought. Let me see. All right. Okay. All right. Let's go. Where are my Oscar things? There we go. All right. So I started the evening saying that it was a bold move for Mr. Jimmy Kimmel to decide not to be funny for his monologue. Now, it, it really, you know... I sometimes think Jimmy Kimmel can be quite good, and he ended up having some good bits later in the evening. However, I felt that he went more for cordial and kind, although he did make a very unfortunate joke about Robert Downey Jr. Uh, but I just felt that he didn't go for laughter. You know, like, you know, we'll talk about John Mulaney a little bit later in the telecast, but I just felt the monologue was soft and too polite. I mean, I can understand him not wanting to bomb like Joe Coy uh, or, you know, some other recent hosts that have done a very poor job, and he's certainly not going to be a Ricky Gervais 
character, right? Like future movie actor, just he wasn't trying to be like Ricky Gervais. Uh, I mean, maybe I guess with the Robert Downey Jr. joke, but for the most part, he was like the anti Ricky Gervais. He was just so kind. I mean, the nicest thing he did was he had everybody, uh, you know, do a round of applause for the Teamsters because the Teamsters, of course, are, are, uh, are in trouble and might be striking, and that's going to be absolutely horrible for the industry. But they, they, well, they complained a lot about it, but they stood by. They stood by uh, the actors and the writers this past summer. So, you know, I think that, you know, it was, it was nice to, to say that, they, that there was going to be solidarity. But, yeah, I thought that Jimmy Kimmel, his opening monologue just was, just was you know, if you're going to host, you got to host. You can't be everybody's friend. You're there to do a job. All right, then, all right, now for the rest of my tweets, I've got glorious pictures. That's another reason I wanted to use them. Taking a lot of pictures of my television. All right, so they, had, uh, they said they had a surprise for us, and they were like, oh, baby, we got a big surprise for you. And what was it? It was that five of the previous winners for each of the main acting categories would come out and tell a little anecdote about all the, all the contenders. And I have to say, some of you said you liked it. I said I would rather see clips. Uh, I, well, here's the thing. I think at some points it was nice, but once you got to like the third or fourth person, you didn't care anymore. Like, I mean, after the third anecdote, you were like, eh, I'm done, you know? Like the first one or two, you were like, oh, that's very sweet. That was a nice thing to say. But then you were like, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I thought also it ended up being like a hazard trap for the winners to like make sure they thanked everyone. I mean, no one ran the gauntlet successfully except for Killian Murphy. And it made me like Killian Murphy more. I thought Killian Murphy was a sweetheart. He went and he thanked and shook every single person's hand. Uh, Emma Stone got, uh, Robert Denny Jr. and Emma Stone in particular got into some trouble with this setup, uh, particularly because they both seemed to ignore not only last year's winners, but both of last year's winners uh, are Asian. And so Kei Huai Kwan and Michelle Yeoh both seem to be ignored. Apparently, Robert Downey Jr. was giving Kei Huai Kwan a bunch of hugs backstage. Uh, and then also, in Emma Stone's defense, Jennifer Lawrence, who's a very good friend of hers, really just like, like really hardcore went after her and I think distracted her from Michelle Yeoh. Was it an error in judgment? Yes. However, you know, I think you're very much caught in the moment. I think Emma Stone did not uh, expect to win. I think Emma Stone maybe was a little bit uh, nervous for having won. Uh, and so I think she did the best she could. But, you know, I saw some people say, see, uh, if, you, if you look at the clip, you'll see Sally Field is trying to literally pull Jennifer Lawrence back because she knows that Jennifer Lawrence is making a big problem for everybody. Uh, so I thought that was, uh, that was very interesting. But yeah, so uh, I think that this just created a, a lot of problems. And again, because it was a surprise, the actors you know, weren't prepared. You know, they weren't like, okay, make sure you thank everybody. Don't pull a Taylor Swift, right? Because uh, it made for some really unfortunate clips online. But it was a booby trap. The Oscars set them up for failure. Uh, so yeah, so I wouldn't hold it again. I mean, it was, again, unfortunate. I think there's, you know, but it was, I don't know, I don't think, I think you should be a little bit more uh, forgiving of, of, of how people conducted themselves because it was, it was tough. But again, Killian Murphy, A++. What a sweetheart. All right, we'll talk about him a little bit more when we get to the winner there. Uh, all right, then... Uh, we started off, it's always, always Best Supporting Actress or Best Supporting Actor. They always start off with this award. Uh, and Devo Divine Joy Randolph, fellow Randolph, no relation, but, uh, you know, I feel a kismet. Uh, as, as, I, as I tweeted, she had an awards, uh, her awards run completed with a full sweep. She won every single award. Uh, I think deservedly so. Uh, there were some great people in that category. I feel bad for Danielle Brooks, who I think killed it in The Color Purple, but it just wasn't her year. It just wasn't her year. Uh, Divine Joy Randolph had a very nice speech. Uh, I thought she was really charming. I really liked a lot of the, all of the speeches I thought had a, a groundedness to them. I love that Divine Joy Randolph said, I'm thanking my publicist because you don't understand how great my publicist is. And a publicist is really important. So I think she was right to, to do that. 
But I thought that was, you know, it was a nice speech, but the, the beginning of the show st started out a little bit slow. We, I think we were all a little bit nervous. There weren't any surprises. Uh, and, it, you know, we were kind of being like, are we just going to be going through the motions for the rest of the evening? All right, then Best Animated Feature. They had a bunch of the shorts. And after this, before we got to Best Animated Feature, they gave out a lot of the shorts. And uh, that was great, and, you know, because the show started an hour early, and so if you were running a little bit late, like I was, this gave you a little bit of time to, like, calibrate. You were like, okay, good. I have a few minutes to calibrate before they get to some of the more major awards. So The Boy and the Heron, uh, I liked that, by the way, they had included the graphics in the back there. And they didn't have those graphics for the rest of the evening. I mean, sometimes they utilize them, but I thought it was a nice idea. If they weren't going to do clips, I would have liked to have incorporated more graphics. Oh, that's, by the way, that's the Mad Max duo, or Furiosa, Chris Hemsworth and Anya Taylor-Joy, looking sun-kissed for sure. Uh, and uh, Miyazaki did not show up. Some people feel it's because he doesn't care. Some people feel it was a statement because of, you know, some of the uh, aggressions from the United States on the world stage right now. Uh, and also, yes, some people feel Spider-Verse was robbed. I mean, they've both won a lot before. Miyazaki's won before. Uh, Spider-Verse won before. I don't really think anybody was robbed or snubbed. Uh, I know that Shamik Moore got pretty emotional online, uh, but you know, that's fine. I mean, Sh I mean, Spider-Verse is all that Shamik Moore has. So, and also Spider-Verse made a ton of money. Spider-Verse is the Barbie of the animation field, right? It made a ton of money. Everybody loves it. It's changing the game. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you want to know how I feel as a Barbie fan, now you know how this, how you, that's how you feel as a Spider-Verse fan. But this was fine. I think this was fine. All right. Oh, by the way, really quick. You know what I thought was also interesting, because I didn't tweet about it at all. Uh, Wes Anderson finally won an Oscar, and he didn't show up. Uh, he won it for best short, live action short for Henry Sugar, and he wasn't there. I thought that was really, I mean, he, and I think he was the hands-on favorite to win. So the fact that he wasn't there, I thought, was uh, odd. All right. Uh, then next up, uh, we had the screenplay, Back to Back. Now, this was the original category. And once Barbie left this category, it was definitely going to be Anatomy of a Falls. I think, you know, as I tweeted here, Anatomy of a Falls probably was going to win even if Barbie had stayed in this category. Because, you know, the Oscars were very much about what does Hollywood want to see themselves as? And they don't want to see themselves as Barbie. You know, it's very interesting to me, though, that, so they celebrated Oppenheimer and Poor Things as they have been celebrating ever since those movies came out. You could tell from the very beginning that those were the films that were going to be celebrated, Oppenheimer and Poor Things. Uh, you know, the craft over, over the commercialism. Uh, however, I do find it quite amusing that Oppenheimer made a ton of money as well. It came very close to a billion dollars, and it was just reported that uh, uh, Christopher Nolan personally took home $72 million. So I, I, it's, it's, it's a little bit hip hypocritical to me, uh, but I do think it was time for Christopher Nolan to be celebrated. Uh, but yes, I think people, they would rather, basically the Academy in Hollywood would rather celebrate anything but Barbie. So if there was any other uh, option to go with besides Barbie, they went for it. Uh, although. Also, another problem was that Anatomy of a Fall and uh, Poor Things cover very similar topics as Barbie. There's definitely an overlap in message. So Barbie had that problem as well. Margot Robbie was there, and I will say just now that I felt kind of bad that Margot Robbie had her spirit killed. She's been dressing as Barbie since the premieres, and for earlier awards shows, she went in Barbie outfits, and she stopped doing it. I just felt bad about that. They, they killed her Barbie spirit. She didn't want to dress as Barbie anymore. I was like, she should have done one last hurrah, man. She should have just done it. Well, do you think Barbie should have worn an outfit? I mean, Mar oh, she's not Barbie. Do you think Margot Robbie should have won a Barbie, wore a Barbie outfit? Do you think she should have finished strong or it was over? I think she's looking, I think now she's looking forward to her career afterwards. Oh, that's funny, Ragu, and sad. They did put her back in the box. Yeah, finish strong, right, Jerome? I think she should have finished strong. Hmm. 
Okay. All right. So I was very happy they won. <clears throat> they said that Steven Spielberg has already approached them uh, to write a script for him. Uh, and I'm sure they're like, we want to direct our own script, Steven Spielberg. Do you want to produce our movie? You know, maybe you want to do that. Uh, that's right, Jonathan. I noticed they were playing Dance the Night Away for, uh, you know, for Barbie. And they also did some Barbie music earlier when they introduced the orchestra. They were using Barbie whenever they could to promote the show, except celebrating it. Whatever. All right, so yes. Yeah, so Anatomy of a Fall one, uh, I think, deserved very nice script. I thought it was nice. All right, then. Cord, then they gave Best Adapted Screenplay. And Cord Jefferson, Cord Jefferson won. Uh, you know, Barbie, I would have liked to have seen uh, Greta Gerwig get some kind of recognition. Everyone said it was the best script they ever read. Uh, I felt it was an incredibly strong script. But Greta Gerwig doesn't need this Oscar. And Greta Gerwig will get an Oscar someday. I think that, uh, you know, every, besides Oppenheimer, which won seven Oscars, and Poor Things, which won four, Every other film just got one Oscar. So they really divided them up amongst the group. And American fiction needed an Oscar. And I think Cord Jefferson is extremely talented. Uh, and I think that it was important to move him forward here. So I agreed with this. Even though I felt bad about what happened to Barbie, it's OK. American fiction, I really am happy that it won this uh, award. I think it would have been a waste if it had gone to Oppenheimer. Because that just, I mean, it just would have been repetitive. Uh, Christopher Nolan already got two Oscars. He got Best Director and Best Picture. So, and also, as the Shah Ashaman just pointed out, Cord Jefferson's speech was incredible. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that he had to come from the back of the main seating area. They didn't put him in the balcony or any of the tiers, but while his actors got to sit up front, Cord Jefferson had to sit in the back. I was like, Hollywood's a brutal town. Let the guy sit with his, with his, uh, with his cast, man. I thought that was really, really, uh, like, I was just like, wow. It never ends. You can have an Oscar-nominated film. You could win, and you still have, uh, get some disrespect. So that's crazy. However, he gave a wonderful speech saying that make more inexpensive films. Because he said the next Christopher Nolan, the next Greta Gerwig is out there. But you will not find them if you do not create opportunities for them to get started. And that's what low-budget films are. So he said if you sacrifice one $200 million script, you could make like 50 or 20 films and give people an opportunity and you know, help the industry. And so it was a beautiful speech. It was fantastic and very fitting for a writer. He's a writer-director now. He started out largely as a writer, but uh, I think that was great. And by the way, American Fiction is doing quite well on uh, digital today. Great movie. Great. Particularly good stream. All right, next person. Uh, then, they, then Poor Things couldn't, couldn't compete with Oppenheimer for any of the big categories. So it became the new Dune or Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, and it started to take all the craft awards. So it took makeup and hairstyling and production design. That was surprising that it beat Barbie for production design. Barbie's production design was incredible. They used, they used so much pink paint that pink paint was on a shortage for a brief amount of time while more had to be made. They got everything right. They perfectly captured recreating uh, like the world of Barbie. But to be fair, the production design on Poor Things was also impressive. And again, that's just who Hollywood decided they wanted to be. Uh, hey, Bernie G, I see you're a new member. That's adorable. Uh, and, but Kareem, Barbie used practical sets as well. They actually built those dream houses. Uh, so I'm not sure why you would point that out. Uh, you know, I think, I think both of them, you know, were a mix of uh, practical and, and backdrops, painted backdrops and, and CGI. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, this was, I think the production design was Barbie's best bet for a second Oscar, but it, ju it just didn't happen. And that's fine. Nobody, I mean, only poor things in Oppenheimer got more than one. Uh, and so then, next up, ah, uh, this was great. This is when the show started to pick up. I was very impressed with this joke. Uh, John Cena, by the way, was wearing a modesty garb. Uh, there are a lot of backstage uh, photos came out. Uh, but, you know, it really wasn't covering up much, to be honest with you. He was pretty much naked. And I really was impressed with his commitment to the joke. 
You know, like he could have had uh, something more obvious covering stuff up, or he could have, you know, had shorts on, or he could have never come out from behind where he was first hiding that little uh, buttress. But the fact that he actually w uh, dressed like that, I mean, actually, you know, like you, like you could pretty much see everything. And he sold the joke. And I just thought it was really fantastic. Down to the Birkenstocks, which were hilarious. And I, I just thought it was great. Uh, you know, he's no stranger to being naked uh, as Peacemaker. He loves his tidy whities uh, not only in the Suicide Squad movie, but, you know, I've seen photos of him, uh, you know, from the show. Uh, so, you know, he, John Cena, I think he would have gone totally naked if it hadn't been for the censors. Uh, and, you know, he's also in a movie right now called Ricky Stenicki, where he's doing some crazy stuff. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I saw some people saying that this was, uh, you know, like a, 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 an initiation for John Cena to get into Hollywood or something like that. And I don't think that's true at all. I think this is clearly, you know, John Cena's sense of humor. I mean, he's been doing this in a lot of his projects. Uh, and I think he likes doing it. And he's funny. So I think it's fine. You know, you don't want to get, the, you don't want the joke to get old. I think he might have peaked here. I think this might be it. Uh, I mean, obviously, he'll probably do some stuff in, in, in Peacemaker, uh, but it was great. I think it was really, really good, uh, and I loved the way that they did the quick costume change to put him in the drapes, and then he was able to finally open the envelope, and uh, to Jimmy Kimmel's credit, he helped set this joke up, and I really felt this is where the, the show started to get its, its, uh, its mojo. You were like, ah, the show is starting to become pretty good. So uh, this, was, this was great. Kudos to everybody who came up with this, and the, uh, per, the, the execution was just fantastic. Uh, all right, then next up, I said, somebody said, well, what about costume design for, for Barbie? But she didn't win. It was, again, poor things. But again, I mean, I understand it. The costumes on poor things were impressive. And in fact, I do think that Barbie, you know, the costumes were good for Barbie, but production design was, was the stronger space. All right, then next up, Zone of Interest won Best International Feature with a, a, a speech that I think was, you know, let's just leave it at, it caused a lot of conversation online. Uh, so uh, Zone of Interest, oh, by the way, also won Best Sound. I have not had a chance to check that movie out yet. Neither is Danny. All right, then next up, I thought this was interesting. Universal was able to get two groups of presenters for the evening, This and Wish, I, and, and Wicked, uh, to promote their upcoming movies. I was like, this isn't airing on uh, NBC, which is Universal's channel. This is ABC. Why is Universal able to use this to promote their film so much? I did think this was a funny bit with them uh, kind of trash talking each other to set up the fall guy. However, uh, Emily Blunt did a similar thing where she kept trashing Dwayne Johnson to promote Jungle Cruise. And she can't do that every time she has a movie come out. Uh, it just becomes less funny. Again, you can't repeat your bits. Uh, I mean, if you have a persona, you can repeat it, but you got to come up with new bits. But yes, this is still Barbenheimer, which I tweeted out. I, I realized I was like, oh my goodness, you know, the fall guy is Barbenheimer because it's Emily Blunt and uh, Ryan Gosling. So they introduced stunt work because, of course, he plays a stunt performer in The Fall Guy. And they had a great behind-the-scenes look at stunt work, which I really enjoyed. But then as I tweeted, I thought it was quite odd. I thought they were going to say, and now we're going to have a stunt category. But they didn't. They just said, yay, stunt people, and left it at that, which made it 1,000% an advertisement for The Fall Guy. It wasn't even like, oh, well, we're going to announce a stunt category, so now the fall guy can, you know, maybe tie into that and everybody benefits. Instead, it was just, I mean, I'm very excited about the fall guy, too. But I was like, you guys, it was a perfect opportunity to announce a stunt category. And I didn't do it. So I was a little bit bummed about that. Hey, Elpidio, welcome to the live stream. All right. Then next up, Robert Downey Jr. I, I had to edit this tweet. Because people thought he actually said this, where he said, I am an Oscar winner, you know, instead of I am Iron Man. He didn't actually say it. I wish he had. I mean, I, but I think he, too, is trying to move away from Iron Man. You know, he had a great run. He made uh, a bleep ton of money. And I think now he's trying to get back to being a serious actor. And he's got the Oscar now to prove it. You know, I will say, with the anecdotes... The person, uh, Sam Rockwell gave his anecdote, didn't he? Who gave the Robert Downey Jr. anecdote? I think it was Sam Rockwell. 
But I th- somebody pointed out and said, in every scene that Robert Downey Jr. was in in that movie, he pulled focus. And part of it, I feel it's because it was the, hey, look, it's Iron Man. <laughs> but I also felt that was true. I was like, yeah, when I think back at it, he kind of did. So yeah, it was fine. And I do believe to a large degree this was a, a career Oscar. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is an incredible part of Hollywood history, even from his pre-Tony Stark work. But he really did, with Kevin Feige, and I think the Russo brothers, but and jo- John Favreau. But Robert Downey Jr. is very much a part of what made the MCU what it was. And so I think he's a huge part of the industry. That's right, Chaplin, uh, Tropic Thunder, you know, his previous Oscar noms. Uh, and I, I think he really deserved this win. I thought his speech was funny when he said he'd like to thank his, his poor childhood. Uh, I just thought he did a great job. And I'm really glad that he finally got recognition. You know, that uh, being Iron Man didn't, to- you know, there is a way back. And so Margot Robbie needs to know that she can work her way back to an Oscar. You know, success is great, you know, and you can be welcomed back in if you, you know, talk about having to do an initiation. If you want to win an award, you got to make the kind of movie that Hollywood wants to give an award to. And, you know, that's what Robert Downey Jr. did. So I thought, I thought that was nice that he won there. So I was very happy. All right. I'll be curious to see what he does next. Will he go back and do, you know, AI Iron, uh, uh, Tony Stark? I don't know. I think he might want to savor this a little bit more and do a, I mean, and do a little bit more serious acting. Then Godzilla, Godzilla minus one, won best visual, visual effects, which I think everybody was anticipating. You couldn't see their shoes. Apparently they had little Godzilla claws on their shoes. I think that's a bit much, but I thought the little Godzilla statues were adorable. And I thought it was really cute that they went with their Oscars, and I was, I was very happy for them. I saw some great video online of everybody back in Japan who couldn't attend. You know, only four people are allowed to win an Oscar, so the rest of the team, I guess, just has to look at it. Uh, but it was very nice, you know, and to see everybody celebrating uh, over in Japan, watching the, watching the show uh, together, and I thought that was nice. So great, you know, really nice win, and I'll be curious to see you know, if they can keep this momentum going. You know, that's, you know, that's the name of the game. It's great to get your flowers, but can you, what can you do with your capital? Remember, poor Mahershala Ali blew all his Oscar capital on becoming Blade, and he a- ended up flushing that down the toilet, that capital. You got you to spend your capital wisely. What are you going to do with your Oscar capital? All right, then next up, you know, usually I wouldn't talk about best editing, but this is Jennifer LeMay. I don't think it's Jennifer. It can't be Jennifer Lame. Uh, but Jennifer Le- LeMay, she is the editor for Oppenheimer. And I thought she gave such a great speech. I couldn't believe how good her speech was. In fact, I at first was just going to tweet, this woman gave a very fabulous, very real speech. But then I was like, I can't not know her name, as, especially as a fellow woman. I can't just tweet up this lady. So I looked up her name, and I'll never forget it now. Uh, and I just think she was fantastic. I thought she did such a good job. I loved her. And she talked about how she said Christopher Nolan took a risk on her, hiring her as an editor, and that everything that she came in to do every day was a gift and a learning experience. And I just thought it was beautiful. Because again, it wasn't like someone who's been working in the industry for 20 to 30 years. It was someone who was still kind of getting their feet wet, still making a name for themselves, and being really real about it. And I just thought it was awesome. So I really liked her speech. It made me an instant fan. I was like, this lady's awesome. Jennifer LeMay. I hope that's how you pronounce the name. Or that's got to be. That's the only other option. Okay. All right, then this was a great bit. At first, I didn't like it. When it was just the twins bit, I was like, yeah, okay, you're still vastly different in height, whatever. Uh, although Jennifer LeMay got the Oscar from these two, and she said that twins was one of her favorite movies. And that's why it was so surreal to get the award from them. And I was like, oh, that's fantastic. I was like, again, I was like, this lady's great. Jennifer, I love you. You're fantastic. But then when they talked about the fact that they were both Batman villains, Mr. Freeze and the Penguin, and then they brought Michael Keaton into it, and he played along and did such a great job. I mean, he really does look like Batman Begins, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Batman Beyond Bruce Wayne with the cravat and everything, you're like, oh my God, it is Bruce Wayne from Batman Beyond. 
And, uh, you know, and th- so the joke was kind of lame until Michael Keaton came in and you were like, incredible. You were like, he sold the joke. It was amazing. I also, I heard that Beetlejuice trailer is coming very soon, if not this week, next week. And when he came out with um, Catherine O'Hara to the Beetlejuice music, I was like, oh, Beetlejuice is coming. Although I thought their jokes were awful. So I was glad, you know, they gave out the, um, uh, what, like, they gave out, they gave out, like, what, costume or something earlier in the evening? I don't remember what they gave out, but they bombed. They totally bombed on stage, and I felt bad for them. Uh, but Michael Keaton at least got to make it up by being a part of this bit. So that was fantastic. All right, then Hoyt Van Hoyt Tema won cinematography for Oppenheimer, as I said he would, because they did so much in camera and didn't use visual effects. But I was surprised that Hoyt Van Hoyt Tema had never won an Oscar before, but now he has. And I was like, oh, Dune 2 is winning next year for sure. But then when I looked up Greg Frazier to tweet him, I, re- I re- was reminded that Greg Frazier won for Dune last year. So, you know, I, I think, like, I think Greg Frazier is going to win again. I'm sorry to say. I mean, to all the other cinematographers out there. Because what Greg Frazier accomplished with um, the, the, the Harkonnen uh, ba- uh, Gladiator Arena, that alone, shooting with, like, uh, what it was, like, uh, uh, int- infrared, for that infrared camera, you, you can't beat that. He's going to get two Oscars. It's just, it's, it's done. He's going to win. There's nobody else who could possibly, you know, Brit, Gladiator is an interesting idea. That's a good one, Brit. Gladiator 2, you might be right. Who's, who's the, who's this DP on that? Let's look it up. Maybe it's one of these two guys. <laughs> Hold on. And I'll check and see how, if the ratings are in yet. Oh, John Matheson. Oh, it's looking good for you, John Matheson. Oh, he did the first Gladiator, too. Interesting. Oh, let me see if the... uh... Oh, was he the DP on the first Gladiator? No, I don't think so. All right, hold on. Let me see if the ratings are in for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. I don't see any ratings in. Maybe we'll talk about them tomorrow. Maybe we'll talk about them tomorrow on tomorrow's live stream. Okay, next, next, next tweet. Then John Mulaney came in, and I actually laughed out loud when he quoted Madam Webb. It was the only time for the evening when I actually laughed out loud. It was the only time, but it was such a funny joke. He was saying that sound was crucial because we wouldn't have famous lines like, and then he listed some really famous lines, and then... He did the Madam Web line, and that was just, it was brilliant. It was so timely. It was just perfect. It was a great joke. Uh, and, th- and then, and I don't even think Dakota Johnson should be upset about it, because part of what makes the line work is that Dakota Johnson delivered it so oddly. And, you know, she should get some credit for that, because she took a lame line and made it a- iconic. So good for her. Uh, but then... He did this great field of dreams bit where he like did a non sec like uh, like a stream of consciousness talking about field of dreams, and that was fantastic. I just think he did a great job. Every he was trending because everybody was like he should be hosting the Oscars. He did like the early Oscar governors ball or whatever you know where Angela Bassett got her honorary Oscar and stuff like that. He hosted that actually earlier this year and he did an incredible job. He is very Seinfeld, Mika. In fact, John Mulaney has entirely modeled his uh, stand-up persona off of Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, and and he, it's great. I'm a big Seinfeld fan. Absolutely love John Mulaney as well. And yes, he does have Jason Bateman's hair. It's hilarious. <laughs> Although Jason Bateman changed up his hair. So everybody's looking different. John Mulaney, at least, should definitely host next year. If he doesn't host next year, somebody really dropped the ball. All right, then next up. All right, I'm just Ken. Ah, as I tweeted, and here's a comparison that somebody put together. They did an homage to Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Barbie, again, so intelligent, never gets any credit for it. That is a brilliant idea to do Ryan Gosling in the Marilyn Monroe uh, spot with the suit that is uh, the match to that. 
and then with the Ken backup dancers wearing the exact same tuxedos but adding uh, um, uh, cowboy hats. It was just, I heard, and I've seen, I've seen uh, photos from, ins I mean, I've seen video from inside the, 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 the Dolby Theater, or whatever it's called now, and people were just going nuts in there. He brought the house down. I mean, as good as it played, uh, it played really well on, on screen, you know, for people watching at home, but it, they did not capture the electricity of being there in the room, unfortunately. But I'm so glad, you know, Ryan Gosling, he might not have been able to win, but at least he brought the house down with this. This was done incredibly well. They had a lot of really good little things that they put in there that I thought were hilarious. Uh, you know, with, you know, the way he kind of did these little bits, you know, I, from, from, and then also they brought back the other Kens, the other main Kens. I thought that was fantastic. It was just, uh, and he was singing along with Margot and Greta and America. And then he went and he said hi to Emma Stone, who he, of course, has made some of his most famous movies with. And that was just great. Just so, so great. I just thought it was so well done, and I was just really happy with how it turned out. Uh, so, yeah, really, really great uh, performance. I just thought, and I really don't think he's getting enough credit for doing Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Just like I'm Just Ken in the movie was an homage to... Uh, very much Gene Kelly's performances, particularly Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain and uh, basically, basically in the uh, movie, it's an homage to Gene Kelly's many musical numbers. And then here they did uh, Marilyn Monroe, which uh, I, I think for a guy to do Marilyn Monroe, I thought was really great. Very much what Barbie was about, very intelligent. And again, not enough credit for that. Uh, okay, so then the next one. Oh, we've got that. Uh, Ludwig Göransson, his second Oscar, also coming from Black, uh, Black Panther. I think it's funny that the editor and the composer, Christopher Nolan, said yoink and took uh, Ryan Coogler's editor and composer for Oppenheimer. And by the way, I don't think that Ryan Coogler gets enough credit for discovering talent. He has discovered some incredible talent. Uh, behind the camera, from Ludwig Göransson to a number of cinematographers, and that's Ryan Coogler, thank you very much, uh, getting all of those people. So I really, and I love Ryan Coogler, big fan of Ryan Coogler. He doesn't get enough credit. Uh, but yes, this is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic score. Love this score. He looks pretty awesome there too, by the way. He looks like a really cool dude. I was like, you look awesome, buddy. I love seeing everybody step up their game. You know, everybody should try and, you know, and, 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 be, and be very, you know, do their best. And he just looks fantastic. Uh, so his second Oscar, again, I didn't really notice this score when I was watching Oppenheimer, but every time they've played it during award season, I'm like, okay, that, that's fantastic. That's great. Uh, and it's going to be one of those scores where they use for the rest of time. Like, for instance, I forget what it was for when they were playing somebody off last night. For some reason, they played the Pirates of the Caribbean score. They just use that score from Hans Zimmer all the time. Pirates of the Caribbean, I hear it constantly, everywhere, when it's totally, it seems inappropriate, but it's always good. And I feel that Ludwig Gorenson scores are kind of like that as well. You'll always be able to use Oppenheimer and everything. Although Oppenheimer, yeah, Oppenheimer, all of them, The Mandalorian, I mean, these are great, great, great scores. He's a very talented person. He'll, I think he's going to win more Oscars. I don't even think he's going to stop it at two. Uh, cool Hive, I'm sure Hans Zimmer does get royalties for all that. Uh, being a composer, apparently, uh, is, a, is a pretty, pretty hot gig. Uh, and the pirate score is amazing, Ricardo. It deserves to be played constantly. All right, next up. Billie Eilish. Uh, apparently, she is an a, a, a EGOT twice or something. Uh, but she won for best song. I still feel it should have been I'm Just Ken. Although she is, I think, like, I think I saw a tweet that she's the youngest person ever to win two Oscars. Uh, she's definitely phenomenally talented. It's nice to see, that's her, you know, that's her, it's nice to see, isn't that her brother? It's nice to see both of them get a little of attention, a little attention for once. Uh, but I, I also, by the way, this is something else that I said, in, as you can see in my tweet, I really, really loved that she talked so nicely about Barbie. Because Barbie, yeah, Barbie was taking a couple of hits, but the fact that she went up and uh, she spoke really nicely about Barbie 
and she treated it with, um, with respect and dignity and how Barbie was important to her, not only as a movie, but as a doll, you know, as something that it stood for. I thought it was really, really nice. So that was great. Oh, she's only triple crown? All right, well, I'm sure she will someday. But she was great. I thought she was really nice. I think, you know, Billie Eilish rocking an amazing style. She looks incredible. I think her brother did a nice job. Uh, and I, th I just thought this was nice. I mean, it wasn't my favorite song in the movie by far. And I still believe that I'm Just Ken should have won. Because I'm Just Ken, you know, this is a nice song. But everybody will remember I'm Just Ken forever. I'm Just Ken will be a famous song that will always stand the test of time. And not only will I'm Just Ken stand the test of time as a song, but also as a sequence within a film. And to me, that's what best song should be. I hate it when they nominate songs that were from the end credits. But that's okay. I'm Just Ken will still stand the test of time forever. But it's fine. But yeah, I mean, I'm not mad about this win, but it's fine. All right, then next up, wow, Killian Murphy. You know, I liked Killian Murphy. I mean, I res okay, I respected Killian Murphy before he won, but him winning made me a Killian Murphy fan. He was so charming and did everything just so perfectly right. I was like, finally, I was like, you got me. One, one membership to the Killian Murphy fan club, please. I'd love to, I mean, I support this guy. I think he's fantastic. Look at that picture I was able to capture of him. He's just, uh, you know, he just, it's just so charming. So, and you know, Paul Giamatti, he'll win again someday. I'm sure he will. And I don't think, I think Paul Giamatti, he might have wore a fake eye for while he was filming, but I've seen Paul Giamatti, as I said before, do that a billion times. But this was so great. I mean, you can't celebrate Oppenheimer without celebrating Killian Murphy because he was the movie. Uh, and, you know, he is very different in real life than he was in Oppenheimer. So that also, I think, is to his credit. You know, it shows true acting. You don't always want to see someone playing themselves, right? So I like that he obviously became someone different to portray uh, Robert Oppenheimer. And that also makes me like him more, because, as you know, one of the reasons I didn't like Oppenheimer as a movie is I really disliked Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, I mean, I don't know if that's what he was actually like, but however he was in that movie, I was like, don't like this guy. But then he gave, uh, so then he, so, okay, so he came up, he shook everybody's hand, all five people, and he looked them all in the eye, and it was amazing. You were like, wow, this guy's incredible. What a pro. You know, it often remind, it reminded me of how you'll often hear about why people work again and again and again, even though they're not a big draw because people just like having them around and they like them personally. Bill Paxton was like that. And I got to meet Bill Paxton right before he died, unfortunately, uh, tragically. And Bill Paxton is that incredible. Bill Paxton is an amazing individual. And as soon as I met him, I was like, oh, no wonder everybody wants to work with Bill Paxton. And I think it seems clearly to be the same with Killian Murphy. And this is why Christopher Nolan loves him so much and keeps, kept bringing him back, because he's a sweetheart. Then he gave an amazing speech. First, I loved what he said about in a world post-Oppenheimer, here's to the peacemakers. And I was like, oh, man, that's beautiful. That's just absolutely beautiful. I loved it. I thought that was such an incredible thing to say. Uh, it just, it, 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 again, it made me love Killian Murphy. It made me feel better about Oppenheimer as a movie. So that was phenomenal. And then, that's right, Michaela, he even gave a shout-out to the Irish. He hit every single point. I couldn't believe it. I was like, Killian Murphy is on fire. He kept his cool. He was charming. He was polite. He was professional. He, he, was, uh, he gave something that was a moving message. And he stayed true to himself and gave a shout out to his people. I was like, my god. It was like, I would actually say it was a perfect acceptance speech. And so that's why I was like, I love the guy. I did hear the Bond rumor. I think the Bond rumor is ridiculous. Even he said that he would not make a good Bond. If he wants to be the Bond villain, that's fine. I don't think he's a good Bond. But he's going to get so many roles now. He will work forever. He will always work. And he's going to be really, really... I mean, he was. I'm sure some of you will say he was successful before, but now he will constantly be on everybody's casting list. Everybody's casting short list. Whenever they need someone, they're going to be like, how about Killian Murphy? And that's phenomenal. Don't make him Dr. Doom. 
I don't think he's going to do a comic book movie. He's going to go make another 28 Days Later, probably. Uh, all right. Next up, Christopher Nolan. You know what? When they, again, when he took to the stage and they said, this is Christopher Nolan's eighth nomination, I was like, ah, oh, he deserved it. I was like, eight noms? No wonder he's so, remember, no wonder he's so thirsty. And he kept his cool. He never got as thirsty as Bradley Cooper. I saw a tweet before we went live and someone said, why did Bradley Cooper become the punching bag for this year's Oscars? And it's because like, he wanted it too badly. He was too thirsty. His whole movie was a thirst trap. I mean, it was just Bradley, as I said when I reviewed it, this movie should be called Bradley Cooper Really Wants an Oscar. And everyone saw right through it. And that's right, Britt. Dunkirk was very thirsty, but Oppenheimer was not. I mean, I didn't agree with a lot of the choices that Oppenheimer made creatively, but I still respect it and understand its, its craft and the choices that it made, so that's fine. Uh, but yes, I, I mean, come on. You can't keep nominating the guy and not give him an Oscar, particularly because he's so crucial to the industry. So he finally is an Oscar winner. He got to receive it from Mr. Steven Spielberg himself. And I never noticed it until that moment, but when they walked off the stage backstage, I don't know if you caught this, but they had the little screens, and they had a screen of Steven Spielberg accepting one of his past Oscars, I believe for Schindler's List. And then they had Christopher Nolan footage that had just been recorded of him accepting his Oscar for Oppenheimer. And that little bit of Hollywood history I thought was beautiful. I was like, oh, that's great. Why am I only noticing these screens now? And then they saw the two of them walking out, talking to each other. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is really beautiful. This is what I want to see. This is the stuff I'm interested in. But yeah, Christopher Nolan did a great, you know, totally deserved icon of the industry. I'm glad he has his Oscar. All right, then, oh, the one surprise of the night. And I wonder how Emma Stone feels about this. Now, I just want to clarify something. Because I constantly have to deal with not all Poor Things fans, but there's a contingent of Poor Things fans that are, you know, difficult. And here's the thing. I have major problems with this film. I don't like this film. I have major problems with it in many areas. It's not just a, a prude situation. I'd have a lot of problems with the movie. But I do understand and respect that a lot of people do care for the movie. In fact, a number of people that I know very closely like the movie. Of course I saw it, Cool Hive. I don't, you know, don't listen to what you see, this stupid stuff on social media. I've seen the movie. I, of course, why else would I have commented on it? But the reason I never reviewed it is because I like Emma Stone quite a bit. Emma Stone, as I said before, was very kind to me when I was in Zombieland 2, and I did the press junket. She was extremely nice to me. She's an incredibly nice person. So I don't want to go and say a bunch of bad stuff about Emma Stone. So I made my peace with the film. I... Warned, warned people about the context because I felt people deserved to know the context going in. I think a big part of the shock to me was not knowing. I think you shouldn't, I think people deserve to know if they're heading into a situation that's that, that adult. You don't have to give any spoilers away, but I, I do feel you need to let people make that choice for themselves if that's some story they want to experience, okay? I don't think you can spring people that, uh, that on people. And that was one of my, that was, I think, perhaps my biggest issue with the film. Uh, so I'm not rewatching that ever, Dylan. No way, okay? Uh, but yeah, so, but, so I don't want to say anything negative about Emma Stone because I think she's a really wonderful person. Uh, and so even though I don't agree with this movie that she made, I'm, I don't want to, you know, I think she's great. She's, in a real, she's a really kind person, and I think you could see from all the behind-scenes footage last night that she is beloved within the industry, and that's probably one of the reasons that she won this award. They just love her, uh, and that's great. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a, Hollywood is a small town, but the fact that she has made such an impact and has so many friends within the industry, I mean, I don't even know if she's good friends with Florence Pugh or if Florence Pugh was like, boy, Emma Stone seems to be the popular girl in Hollywood. Let me see, she's, I think I was wondering if Florence Pugh was like, let me see if I can go make friends with her because this seems to be like the, the club, you know? And Hollywood does sometimes have a club-like feel. You know, like look at the older club that got in trouble trying to get Andrea Riseborough a nomination, right? So there's like the older club, and I think Emma Stone might be the queen bee of like the younger generation of that same group. 
So I, I think that's I think that's very interesting. But you can see that everyone. I, oh, by the way, I love just with like Killian Murphy. I was like, I can't believe I captured that picture of Emma Stone. That's a great picture of her. But look how close Ryan Gosling still is with her. I mean, she is just clearly really loved and respected um, in the industry. And so I think that's one of the reasons that she won. Do I feel bad for Lily Gladstone? Yes, I do. Uh, some people pointed out that Lily Gladstone will probably never have another opportunity to win again. And I think that's unfortunately true. You know, of course, obviously never say never, but it's probably not going to happen. Uh, she has the only thing coming up. I think she has some small film and then she got like a television streaming series. I think it's a prestige series, which is nice. But it's probably never going to happen. She's just, that was it. That was her shot. I mean, she's obviously, the work will live forever. The role will live forever. But she's not going to get it. And I've seen a number of people also say, hey, you know, uh, the best person should win. But you know what? That's really speculative. You know, that's an opinion. I think an argument could have been made for every one of those actors. Well, not maybe every one of them. But I think like three out of the... Three out of the five, you could have made a convincing argument that they should be the one to win. You know, Hollywood makes up the argument that they want to. And so I feel like, why is it in some categories, it's somebody's turn, but in other categories, oh, let's think about the work that we're talking about specifically. I think it's the inconsistency of it that makes it so frustrating. But it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, Ivan, I think Sandra Holt Hewler has a better chance of being nominated again than Lily Gladstone. I feel really bad about it, but I don't think Lily Gladstone, well, I, I just, it's not going to, I don't think, I mean, I would love for it to happen someday. I think that would be great. Uh, and I hope that Lily Gladstone, you know, doesn't let this de be defeatist for her. And I hope she just fights, 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 and sees if she can make another, um, Make, make something that maybe would get her back in the running. Uh, Stebity says, how would it be her turn? Well, I believe she would have been the first Native American actor to win, correct? And she really did hold up that movie. I would have voted for Lily Gladstone because I feel like Emma Stone already won. Uh, an Oscar. And I know some of you are like, well, that shouldn't matter. But I do think, I think it should matter. I think it should matter. I don't think that Emma Stone needed to win this for Bella Baxter to be forever remembered and for people who appreciate Bella Baxter to appreciate her. So as a voter, I would have gone with Lily Gladstone. And I do wonder, what was the block that kept people from voting for Lily Gladstone? What was it? You would like to hope that it wasn't the obvious because she wasn't even nominated for the BAFTAs, you know? But it's, 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 you know, really unfortunate. All right, so I, I, think, I think it should have been, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I think it should have been Lily Gladstone. But I don't hate on Emma Stone because it's Emma Stone. Remember what Mickey, uh, remember what Sean Penn said when he beat Mickey Rourke? Remember? I mean, the people who won, it's, they have nothing, the, the actors themselves have nothing to do with it. You know, it's, it's Hollywood as a whole that's responsible for that. Uh, all right. Then we got Best Picture. Oh, and of course, Al Pacino. You know, they always want someone who's older to do this award. But boy, does it keep being a crazy time when they do. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor, of course, did the infamous, you know, Gladiator, you know, announcement. Uh, then Warren Beatty is the one who read the wrong movie when said La La Land. Well, you know, in his defense, he was given the wrong envelope. But poor Warren Beatty got stuck with saying uh, uh, La La Land when it was, in fact, Moon Knight. I mean, Moon Knight. Moonlight. And then Al Pacino came out there, and it was nuts. Al Pacino was just, you know, he just, you know, he ripped open the envelope and said Oppenheimer before anybody knew what was happening. It was hilarious, you know? Uh, I saw a number of funny descriptions of him. Like, it was like he just shuffled out of bed and was like, oh, yeah, here you go, Oppenheimer. And it was just absolutely hilarious. Uh, you know, Heinz E-Adventures, that's right. You know, you don't I, mean, I don't think he was going to stand there and read off 10 movies. But I think there was supposed to be a little bit more ceremony than there was. It was really, really funny. But look at how beautiful the stage was, by the way. Those flowers that they put in at the last minute, 
Let me make that a little bigger because it's just so gorgeous so you can see it. Look at that. Look at the pink flowers. Oh, it's so beautiful. Look at that. Oh, that's just stunning. You know, I didn't like the stage up until then. And then I was like, oh, that's really nice. That looks great. I love that. No weird social media influencers snuck up on the stage like at the BAFTAs and threatened everybody's security. And then there's Christopher Nolan and his wife, Emma Thomas, right, uh, collecting their Oscar. And I'm very, very happy. Oh, Cool Hive, I think pink and orange is one of the best combinations. Uh, so yeah, so Oppenheimer, best picture. Christopher Nolan got one in there. He, can che he checked that box, and now he can go back to doing something else. Uh, he doesn't have to worry about this anymore. You know, just like Leonardo DiCaprio for a while was like, Oscar, 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 Oscar. Now, Chris, you know, and I think, you know, Bradley Cooper needs to take a break. But, you know, now uh, I agree, Ricardo. He's got to do Bond next. That's what I want to see him do. Uh, but I'm just, you know, I think it's, I'm fine with, you know, I think it should have been Barbie. But if it's not Barbie, I'm very happy with the choice of Oppenheimer. Even though, again, I did not care for the film. When you step back and you look at the history of Hollywood, I think Oppenheimer is good. And also, it's better than any other choice that they had. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm glad it wasn't poor things. You know, I'm, I'm happy with the way things went down. It could have been a lot worse. You know, at the end of the day, Barbie impressed with the I'm Just Ken musical number. Oppenheimer is a good, safe middle ground. Uh... And I think the poor things was still respected. Uh, all right, so let's do the Q&A. We talked about that for a good long time. All right, hold on. All right, you can ask me anything you'd like for 10 minutes until 4, 4.10. Oh, Danny, I did see the part of Messy the... I'm so glad Messy the dog was there. And I thought it was absolutely hilarious that they had him clapping during the telecast. I thought that was hilarious. By the way, it was Mother's Day in the UK yesterday, and every time someone thanked their mother, I got freaked out. Oh, thank you, we see. And I was like, is today Mother's Day? Did I forget Mother's Day? So that was like, that was freaking me out all evening. I'd be like, oh, no, wait, it's UK Mother's Day. And then I'd forget again, and I'd be like, oh, my God, is it Mother's Day? It wasn't the real messy Brit? It was a messy stand-in? What's with the conspiracy theories coming out of the UK? Hey, Eddie Wu. You know, and I, I'm not a royal conspiracist, but I got to tell you, Kate Middleton's Photoshop photo is uh, really making me laugh. Danielle, we're, uh, you can start doing the comments now. I wasn't reading comments earlier because I was just doing the straight talk through. Uh, Michael Hartshorn says, what does the stunt category look like to you for the Oscars? I think it would have to be, you know, it would be like with VFX and other categories. It would be uh, a group of people, you know, a, like three to four people. And it would certainly be the stunt coordinators, maybe like one of the leads. You know, they would have to set parameters. You know, there, every time there's a category, there's also a group within the academy to represent that category. So you'd have a group of stunt people, and they would come up with the parameters for what, how many people and who should be nominated. And then when people submit... That's when they give the names that would qualify. All right, let's see here. Danielle, I'm going to look for your comments. Rashad says, Lily Gladstone does have the Best Actress nominee in front of her name now. Doesn't that mean something? You know, one would hope, Rashad, but the problem is that it doesn't always mean something. Sometimes... Sometimes, uh, hold on, I got distracted. Okay, some uh, sometimes it's not enough. Plenty of people have won an Oscar and you've never heard from them again. So I think it's certainly an advantage that she has, but it's not a guarantee because I don't think she's established enough. If she'd already had a strong foothold in the industry, then I think maybe she would be a little bit more safe. But because she's still so new, she's, she's not quite there yet. Cool Hive says that Messi the dog couldn't get a visa. That's, was it, didn't he have a visa for the luncheon? Was that a fake dog at the luncheon? I'm sure Ryan Gosling feels, feels dirty and cheated because he, he, he was with that dog the most. Uh, Nicholas says, hey, Grace, today is my 22nd birthday, and I'd like to thank you for always making the channel a safe space. Ah, oh, and the community feels like a family. Well, I'm glad we could, I'm glad you spent part of your birthday with the BTT family. 
Oh, it was the dog, but it was filmed prior. That makes sense. That was a, but then what was Ryan Gosling reacting to? Let's see here. Steven says, Lily had 56 minutes of screen time in a three-hour film. Maybe Emma had more movie helping her. I don't agree with that. I mean, again, you know, you, people just come up with stuff to, to excuse what they decide they want. You know, unless it's an actual rule, it doesn't really make any difference. Yes, Lupita Nyong'o, uh, you know, her, her Divine Joy Randolph comments were beautiful, and Divine Joy Randolph gave her a special shout-out, in fact, when she took the stage. Danielle, I'm looking for your comments. I don't see it. Cosmics liked Jimmy Kimmel reading the tweet. You know, I didn't like reading the tweet until I saw who it was from, but I didn't see any reason to bring politics into the evening, although I think it was a very embarrassing and petty and, and, re and really beneath a presidential candidate tweet. Uh, let's see here. Alberto says, do you think Oppie would have been the same movie if Nolan had stayed with Warner Brothers? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yes, I do, because I think that... Um, he had, Christopher Nolan has total creative control at this point in his career. I think the difference might have been who was running the awards campaign, and I think Universal has a more successful awards campaign office for some reason than uh, Warner Brothers does. Noah Carter says, what is your most anticipated project coming up for 2024? I'm personally looking at most for Inside Out 2. I guess like Deadpool and Wolverine right now, to be honest with you, off the top of my head. That's right, Jose. Uh, Yalitza Aparicio uh, from, um, uh, from Roma. She, won you know, she was nominated and never heard from her again. Uh, thank you, Paris. I appreciate that. Natalie Sue says, maybe Martin Scorsese's team will help Lily going forward. He was already talking to her and trying to lift her spirits during the, the telecast back, you know, behind the scenes. But, I mean, that would be nice, but I don't, I don't know. I don't really see Scorsese doing that, to be honest with you. Danny says, Who, what, what was the best speech of the night, in your opinion? As I said, Killian Murphy. Killian Murphy gave the most perfect acceptance speech I've ever seen. Then I would go with Cord Jefferson and then Jennifer uh, LeMay. Danielle, I feel awful. I don't see any, you know, if you read, enter it, I'm looking for it. Teriyaki Donuts, don't feel bad for the creator. He got uh, Jurassic, uh, the new Jurassic World movie. Let's see here. Kareem Worrell, I don't know why Eva Mendez wasn't Ryan Gosling's date for the Oscars. Apparently he and uh, uh, Eva Mendez have a very private relationship to the point where she'll only be backstage. I mean, it's their business, but um, that's the way they want to run their life. But, I mean, we all know that they're married. Let's see here. Uh, of the Tide, that's very kind of you. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I appreciate it. I get nervous being in HD because it's very unforgiving. It's been a little scary to upgrade, so I appreciate that. Let's see here. All right, Danielle. Where is your comment? I'm looking. I'm going back. It's okay, Steven, you're not too late. Okay, Danielle, I feel bad. Oh, uh, let's see here. Steven says, will Emma Stone peak too soon like Hilary Swank after winning two Oscars really young? No, I don't think so. I don't think Hilary Swank is as beloved as Emma Stone. I think Emma Stone at this point will work for the rest of her life until she doesn't want to anymore if that ever happens. I think Emma Stone is set for life. She's set, as a, as a, unless like she gets canceled. But I don't think that's going to happen because she's a really nice person. Let's see here. Staggervore says, I think cutting off the guy who worked on the Godzilla movie with the music while he was trying to communicate his speech was somewhat of a low blow. Yeah, but at the same time, you can't let these things go on forever. 
I mean, they actually ended on time, which was incredible. I mean, that was shocking. Diego says, Grace, I introduced you to my girlfriend, and she appreciates your lively commentary, and she agrees that Oppenheimer sucks. Hello, Diego's girlfriend. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad we agree on that. It's very nice to meet you. Let's see here. Let's see. Nintendard, I'm glad to see you're here. Future movie actor says, Faye Dunaway read the wrong name, not Warren Beatty. Well, he was, right, he was standing right next to her. Oh, Danielle said the moment's passed. Ah, oh, Danielle, you're a sweetheart. I give you a hug. Let's see here. To celebrate the 100th Oscars, how do they make it special, says Mish. Um, that's a good question. You know what I would do to make the 100th Oscars special? You know what they should do for all the Oscars? I'd make it a whole week of programming. Wouldn't that be great? With spotlights on the different movies and behind-the-scenes interviews and talking to the nominees and spotlighting their movies. And that, I think, maybe would make it a little bit more special than just yet another awards show. Oh, I love that idea. I just gave it for free. You're welcome, ABC or whoever makes the Oscars. That's what I would do. I do a whole week of programming, and I think that would be really wonderful. That's what I would want to do. Indian, you, uh, Indian Indianesis. What shade of lipstick am I using? That's very nice of you to ask. Well, part of it is my natural lip color. And then I have this gloss from uh, Mineral Fusion, which is like a stick for, for eyes, lips, and cheeks. And it's called Rosette. They sell it at Whole Foods if you're ever looking for it. That's very nice of you to ask. I'm glad you want to know. Justin Bocci says, any truth to Lindsay Lohan being cast as a role in the MCU? I haven't heard that, and I think that would be ridiculous. I would not do that. As, as excited as I might be for Irish Wish, no. Uh, Daniel Harati says, do you think Dune 2 would have stolen some of Oppen... I, I'm I don't... I think it would have, but I, I'm glad they're at separate years. I think Dune 2 will do very well at the Oscars next year. Oh, it's 4.10 already. Hold on. Jay says, hey, Grace, I love what you do. Rewatching American Hustle, I firmly believe Bradley Cooper is better as a supporting actor. Oh, that's a good one, Jay. I think Bradley Cooper needs to take a break. I think he's just, he's too high on his own supply. All right. Stephen, thank you for gifting a membership. Uh, Gorilla My Dreams, I did talk about that Godzilla uh, heels. I thought they were a bit much. I preferred the little Godzilla statues. And then future movie actor says, Emma was definitely shocked and probably expected it to be Lily. As I said on Twitter, a very creative movie, but it's not for everyone, though, certainly. Yes, that's very diplomatic of you. I appreciate it. Then Tendard, what's my favorite scary movie? Uh, the Shining, but I guess also Scream. Okay, all right. All right, you guys are all very nice. You guys are great. I really love you guys. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to talk today, but that's our time. Let me do some quick shout outs. Daniel says, rate the Oscars one out of 10? That's a good question. An eight. Oh, let's see here. Art Lover says, do you think Nolan will direct the next Bond movie? Uh, I hope so. I'm not sure, but I hope that he does. Oh, Super Sisu, you want the new glasses in HD? Oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Those glasses are crazy. And in HD, I mean, you'll see every little crazy detail. Maybe. Eth okay, let me give some shout outs. Ethan says, flying into New York City this week for Sweeney Todd. Ooh, that'll be fun. I saw that show. Uh, Kyle, I I'm just, you know, have a good time. Kyle Kristoff says, hello from a cruise in the Caribbean. Wow, Kyle. Smooth sailing. Uh, Just Blaze Disney is playing Mortal Kombat 1. That's fantastic. Oh, Marduk, I'm so glad you like the HD. Hey, Babette. Babette, welcome back. Sensation says, I'm about to do some much-needed laundry right after your stream. Well, Manditos is playing uh, the Oscar, you're out of time music. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, that's all the time we have. Uh, we see says, hello from sunny St. Petersburg. Well, Mish says, uh, going to do a short workout, shower, and watch the Oscars clips. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to a screening for Roadhouse. They're making me watch it in a movie theater. 
I think it's hilarious. They won't show it in movie theaters, but they're making me watch it in one. Uh, Adam Sphere says, on a work trip in North Carolina. Ah, uh, that's awesome. Enjoy that work hotel. Uh, let's see here. Steven Zampuno, Z- Zumpano says, reviewing Ariana Grande's new album. That's great. That's awesome. I listened to it a little bit. It was pretty good. Let's see here. Nintendo says, at work on the assembly line. And you're, text- and you're able to communicate with us? That's incredible. Oh, my goodness. I hope you didn't miss anything on the assembly line, but I love it. And then future movie actor says, still at work, getting a late lunch soon. Uh, um, Lisa, Roadhouse premiered at South by Southwest. That's why some of the reviews came out. But Roadhouse actually doesn't come out until March 21st. By the way, I just watched my Invincible screeners, the the second half of uh, part two, four episodes. Some of the most incredible stuff I ever saw. I can't wait to go over it with you. It was just amazing. Don't sleep on Invincible part two. It came back. Like, as I tweeted, straight fire. All right, everybody, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be reviewing Roadhouse, and we'll have another live stream. Bye.